Hello and welcome to Artificial Intelligence for Startups. Hi, this is Aryan and this is going to be a one hour uh, session on how artificial intelligence applies to startups. These are going to be our topics for today. So we're going to start with uh, what is artificial intelligence? We're going to be talking about what growth prospects artificial intelligence brings for startups, uh, how AI funding has grown, how AI startups have been performing when it comes to venture capital deals. Then we're going to talk about applications of artificial intelligence in different sectors. Then we're going to get into artificial intelligence and understand the different terminologies that we use in the sector. What types of artificial intelligences do we have? Uh, some AI concepts, AI terminologies, the frameworks and technologies behind artificial intelligence. and then how to build and how to deploy uh, AI models, how to run AI models, how to serve AI models to your customers, and then a few enterprise artificial intelligence application case studies. So to get into it, let's start by defining what artificial intelligence is. To do that, let's define what intelligence is. Intelligence is the ability of an organ of an organism of a being to understand its environment make decisions and make sense of its environment to be aware to be conscious artificial intelligence is the ability of uh, algorithms machines and computer systems to perform tasks take decisions uh, mimic human intelligence you may already have a few ideas uh, in mind when it comes to artificial intelligence and those ideas may look something like this. These ideas you may, you may be having from watching science fiction or other movies that you and consuming literature that you might have consumed. But artificial intelligence is already a part of our everyday life. And why I say that is because you have, you're surrounded by, by all these tools that we already use that are using artificial intelligence. Uh, we have all the virtual assistants that Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, they uh, run on a lot of natural language models. Uh, you have Tesla with their self-driving cars and more are incoming. You have all the social media networks like Facebook and others who are doing facial recognition so that they can tag you in posts and also, they have their recommendation engines, so they recommend what type of content would you like to watch. You have all the Google products. You have Google Translate, which uses machine translation. And you have Google Search, which uses uh, natural language models to read different web pages and PDFs and documents, and it indexes them, and then you get better search results. Imagine a world where all of the processes, all of the monotonous tasks specifically, are taken care of by artificial intelligence. And people are doing what they're best at. People are doing more intuitive, more creative work. Every single process that we can see today would be assisted, automated, and augmented with the help of artificial intelligence. It's going to be everywhere, every process that we know of. And it's going, the world is going to be different. And this is going to happen sooner than we expect. AI already is in a lot of places today. There are a few services that use artificial intelligence already. So you have all the virtual assistants, uh, the Siri, Google Assistant, Alexa, they are there. Then you have Amazon with their recommendation engine. Amazon looks at what products you've been browsing and then it clusters similarly bought products and then it shows you those products. So it has a recommendation engine that recommends you products. You have Tesla with the self-driving cars. You have Netflix with their recommendation engine. It looks at uh, what, how many minutes did you watch a particular uh, piece of content, any movie, any series, and how was your attention? Then it recommends you uh, the things that you might like, and then you stay, you spend more time on Netflix. Then there are these platforms which host uh, AI models. These are cloud hosting services and different. Uh, services that help in the facilitation and running of artificial intelligence. And then there are frameworks, technological frameworks, research technologies, which 
you know, are used to build all of these services. They are, these names are not all, there are more names and we'll talk about them later in the presentation. Artificial intelligence is not just in the technological uh, sector. It has its application in all sectors and here are some names and the total number of names that the companies that have applied artificial intelligence already is going to be an endless list. And so here are some names and here are more. In short, artificial intelligence is being applied in various sectors and it has a lot of applications. And today we're going to understand how those applications play out, how do they work and how uh, you can get started to implement something of your own. And also looking at a few case studies of how other people have implemented it. All of these artificial intelligence models we can uh, plot on a spectrum. Right now we're working in the domain of artificial narrow intelligence. And what that means is artificial intelligence algorithms, which are specialized for one task, let's say uh, recognizing uh, speech, which would be Siri or uh, classifying images for a medical example, that would be another specialized example. Right now we have artificial narrow intelligence algorithms and we'd be we're progressing towards artificial general intelligence. That means AI algorithms getting smarter at understanding and understanding human language so that we can tell them to do things like we tell a human. And later on down the line, um, AI would be able to perform more tasks. It's not something to be scared of, um, particularly. These are the three, uh, three categories. Artificial narrow intelligence is the specialized AI algorithm, which is trained on a particular type of data, performs one specific task, and then we're heading towards artificial intelligence that's more uh, understandable and can do more tasks for us. This is where we are right now. Here are some of the skills and tasks that AI is able to do today. So you can train an AI model by, uh, you have your model and then you can train it by giving it some data. So you, either you give it, uh, either you can train it as an image uh, recognition model or speech to text or anything, uh, uh, any natural language model or any sort of uh, predicting of data points, any classification of certain type of data or any prediction of certain parameters. And then you, all of these models combine in together to form an, a piece of intelligence and algorithm, which can be handed over some tasks and that tasks it can do for us. And the backbone of all of this is uh, machine learning. So AI learns from the data that we give it. So we make a model and then we feed it with data and then we train the algorithm. You might have heard of these terms. There's artificial intelligence, data science, machine learning, and deep learning. So artificial intelligence encompasses itself uh, within itself, the term machine learning. Machine learning is what powers these AI algorithms. Let's say it's uh, a model that recognizes uh, speech. So it, it has it has been trained on a uh, sample rate with a sample data of a lot of speech uh, notes, a lot of speech samples. And that process of making that AI model is called machine learning. That is the machine system, the algorithm learning from the data that it's been provided with. Deep learning, uh, it's like a buzzword term. Uh, what it means specifically is these machine learning models getting so large and having so many nodes and then requiring large data sets to train on. Uh, and this, this increasing size of these models is called deep learning. Then you have data science, which is, uh, which overlaps with artificial intelligence because AI encompasses in itself a lot of uh, cleaning of the data and a lot of working with the data and data science also has uh, visualizing, uh, getting insights from data, uh, doing regression predictions and getting trends from data, a lot of that too. AI has its applications in different sectors that that is, it's not just a technology by itself. It applies to different sectors and it has its utility in these sectors. And we're going to touch upon a few examples of how it applies to all of these different sectors today. Like for example, 
uh, when it comes to travel, it can recommend you uh, different uh, vendors to book your tickets from. Like these travel providing sites are already doing it. Help they help you find the best option. They have a recommendation engine there. AI can help you uh, plan your trip. AI can help you in uh, communicating with uh, foreigners in different languages. You have machine translation and you have Google Translate and all these services and more are incoming. And uh, even communication would be uh, more streamlined as if you were talking to some other person, you speak your native language and the person would speak their native language and it would be seamless. Retail, like uh, shopping at different places and automatic billing, recommending you the right products, guiding you to the right shelves and, and also getting the products to you directly. Banking, uh, a lot of things are happening over there as well. Uh, manufacturing, automation, healthcare. We're going to talk about a few of these examples later on in the presentation. There's been a rapid growth in the adoption of artificial intelligence since 2016. And this is how the graph looks. So at around uh, 2016, you, we had an influx of a lot of AI research, a lot of people working on AI. There were a few breakthroughs. There were uh, frameworks which people could use and uh, deploy AI models with. And since then, AI adoption has been on the rise. And then 2020 came about. But even in 2020, with the whole corona crisis, 30% of the organizations actually plan to increase AI investments. And only 16% had temporarily suspended their AI investments. And the AI growth graph is only going to grow afterwards because of the value it provides. It enables us to focus on the tasks that we're good at, and it takes care of all the uh, robotic monotonous tasks that we can and should automate. Here are a few sectors in which AI is going to generate a lot of revenue when it comes to uh, whether image recognition, image tagging models, it's projected that deploying these models would bring in these many results. And these applications like predictive maintenance and uh, text query, if images, text query of images is being used by Google, predictive maintenance that are uh, in the industrial sectors, a lot of companies are coming up with predictive maintenance solutions, let's say, um, so we had worked with the army for one uh, particular thing where uh, we, we were uh, brainstorming on and work. It was how to predict the life of different components. So like an engine has a specific number of running hours and predictive maintenance has a lot of applications in the industrial sector. And likewise, people are already working on these solutions that they're going to be out there and they're going to be a part of our workflow. Uh, in the uh, in different workflows of different big businesses altogether. Here are all these sectors uh, in which AI growth is predicted. Now, one thing you'd notice from this graph is that AI growth is pred predicted in almost all sectors, and it's going it's growing it's going to grow exponentially in all of them because it applies to processes, and then the processes are repetitive, and then that leads to scale and growth. You might also be wondering why uh, this adoption of AI has been increasing since then. And it can be these three factors, I would say, are the most are the biggest contributing factors to the growth that we've seen. There is there's been new research since 2016. We have new research papers which highlight different procedures, protocols, new algorithms, which help us do more. And those algorithms are possible because of the increasing computing power, which we have available in the late sixties, when the, uh, when they sent people to the moon, they only had as much computing power as a regular calculator. I'm not talking about a graphing calculator, just a regular calculator. And, uh, with all of these things, we, everything now collects data. So your phone tracks you 360 times a day, and then Google uses that data to analyze a lot of things. And then it comes out with products. So you can even go, you, there's this thing by Google called location history, and it would tell you where all you went. Like you, you drove there and you took you, you were on a flight and you took a taxi, or whatever. It would tell you every single thing. 
and where uh, you've checked in all the places you've been so it looks at a lot of data all your search history and everything what you read and google then makes its products so they they released uh they they release google news which gives you a compilation of the different news articles you read after studying uh, what you read and then also showing you highlights the things that are relevant news it also does fake news detection a lot of things and uh, with Google Photos, because you have your photos over there, it looks at your photos and it suggests you different filters. That which it has, Google has, has gotten there uh, by analyzing all of the data it had collected. So these three factors have led to a lot of AI models being coming about and then doing a lot of things for us. And it's not just very technical specific applications ai has its application in uh, everyday tasks that, that we do so when it comes to predictive text it ai can help you write your emails AI can help you correct uh, or improve language it can it gives you route suggestions google maps that is the world runs on google maps it has voice assistants chatbots uh, Google search and everything, a lot of, uh, even every social media, how you, how you're presented content and how you keep seeing relevant content that you like, that is all powered by machine learning. There's also been a growth in AI startup funding. This is how the graph looks from 2016 to 2020. Uh, in 2020, the it wasn't as high as it was predicted because of the pandemic, but still the, uh, it, it has been on the rise because now we've seen that people are at their homes in automation and uh, the assistance of processes through artificial intelligence and how we are uh, working with remote workflows and how we need automation. That's That's, very much important. So it's been on the rise and it would be on the rise. Here are some more graphs of the different fundings, um, venture capital deals that we've seen. And this includes all startups, like from the seed stage to series, pre-series, seed, and later on CD stages, everything. In 2019, it was the highest and it would be uh, and that that's only going to grow from now on as the world normalizes and we uh, more AI startups come about. A lot of uh, big uh, venture capitals and now venture capital firms are now focusing on AI as a dedicated sector. You can go on their websites, like you can go to Sequoia or some others in, or 500 startups or whatever. And you can see that they have a dedicated section for AI. And the, a lot of their investments have been on AI first startups. Now it's not just about AI first startups. AI first startups mean that a startup whose core product uses artificial intelligence and then it provides artificial intelligence to its customers. AI also applies to every other startup and in their sub processes. That is where cumulatively it provides uh, the highest amount of value. And you can see that the number of uh, AI ideas have been rising. 2020 was uh, because of the pandemic, it was like that, but it's, it's again, it's picking up and it would get back to normal levels. And uh, you'd, you'd, you'd see another thing. Early stage venture capital, uh, angel rounds and seed rounds, those have also been high when it comes to artificial intelligence because it's a new uh, industry and the, uh, the people who have the solution, they are valued. So it's a field where uh, competence matters. You can get started and if you have the solution, it's the barriers to entry are not that high. And this I'm talking about AI for startups. And also the startups who have applied AI in their processes, their valuation has also gone up significantly because of the results they're getting, because of the automation they've put in. The, the increased number of venture deals is a product of how much startups have grown because of artificial intelligence. The revenues of AI startups, 
the projections are high and we've already seen that uh, when companies have put in automation in their processes it uh, it it leads to higher efficiency and in turn higher revenues another parameter to look at when trying to assess the growth of startups because because of artificial intelligence is going to be jobs and we've seen that the number of uh, vacancies for ai jobs that has gone up significantly and that shows that there's uh, there's growth in this sector and then people and companies are looking for this and all the graphs are going to reflect that ai job postings have been on the rise these are all the different sectors of ai growth and you would see that uh, ai has its applications in in different areas also um, people working in ai have are, are paid the highest salaries which means that uh, the value that it's providing it's uh, it's higher and it's like it's it's more valuable compared to the companies who are not uh, putting in incorporating these practices also location wise uh, in every location salaries of people working in ai is is high which means that they are putting out something which is valuable in 2017 i was at stanford university and i saw uh, this rising trend of artificial intelligence and stanford university is world's uh, second highest in computer science and it's just 12 kilometers away from silicon valley where a lot of uh, new technological revolution happens uh, over there these companies are open to new ideas and a lot of people are uh, working towards build uh, bringing these automations and helpful tools that help people uh, get more done and these companies are adopting them and i saw a similar trend uh, but only more uh, when i was at mit in 2018 Uh, it was a tech entrepreneurship program and only two students were there from india so i was working with the mit uh, computer science and artificial intelligence lab and i saw the technological side and the possibilities that you know ai brings and since then i was also working on ais uh, and i was uh, like working with, i have many friends there now and we we get we are in touch and we see the sort of how the industry is pro uh, progressing and what trends uh, can we derive from that here are a few professors that i worked with over there and then uh, this is mit startup accelerator now it's 70% of the startups over there were ai startups in 2018 so these were startups which were so valuable that they had valued them uh, to and they were given a place at mit's red dot which is like an accelerator and it helps startups to more uh, it gives them funding it gives them guidance and this is the center for entrepreneurship at mit and i saw th this there and i interacted with different people we discussed ideas i had a few meetings and then like we also followed up later there's there are two startups which i'm still in touch with and this was uh, my presentation over there Using smartphone box that put on the back of the box. It has great smart emitters and receivers that has sensors to detect whether objects are in the car. We also monitor the car. Using smartphone box. It's a we are we are a lot of fun there. We we experimented with a lot of AI ideas and overall it was a good experience. I'll tell you later on how uh, the how we explored AI solutions and uh, the different ideas we employed. AI is uh, the next big thing. Like we had the different industrial revolutions, we had uh, mechanization, factories, and then we had electricity and assembly line and batch production facilities. Then we had the internet um, connectivity, and the influx of all the this connectivity brought knowledge and. uh mechanization more of it now we're going to have automated intelligence which means that we don't need um people doing uh, repetitive things that they don't like we can have uh, we can build automations by artificial intelligence which 
take care of these uh, processes, the parts that we don't like, the repetitive parts, so that people can just be there, uh, they can monitor and they can uh, focus on brainstorming and problem solving and the more creative parts of the process. AI is also going to bring uh, universal basic income, which means that the jobs which are going to be restructured because of artificial intelligence, um, they, they need to be given a set amount of income per month. And these companies that are going to be a part of uh, incorporating artificial intelligence, they're going to be at the forefront of this and they're going to uh, like benefit a lot from the change that's going to happen. And these universal basic income trials have been, um, they've been carried out at different places. Internationally, yes, even in India, there was a trial in Madhya Pradesh and a lot of governments are giving it a try to see how people are responding to it. These are the results of the trials. AI sometimes is called the fifth industrial revolution because it unlocks the, uh, it unlocks values in different dimensions. As people are not burdened by the monotonous robotic work, they can focus on other things. They can focus on brainstorming. They can focus on problem solving. They can focus on creativity so that more things come about. Many people are stuck in just the operations of one particular thing, not on brainstorming solutions, not on brainstorming what's ahead, not on brainstorming how to improve and not on brainstorming how to, uh, how to drastically change and uh, revolutionize processes. AI can help us do all of that because it will help us take care of the different boring processes in, in different workflows. It's a, in the beginning and how uh, the projections have been, it, it's feared that AI will take jobs, but that's not true. It's going to restructure jobs and it's going to create more jobs than it's going to take. And this is how the, the graph is going to look like. It's going to employ a lot of data scientists, a lot of uh, AI and ML engineers, a lot of people who build these AI models and a lot of people who apply uh, these models and are doing like uh, who are who are in the part of building the whole uh, thing that's coming about. It's all it is obviously going to take some jobs like uh, data entry jobs or very, uh, you know, jobs which were uh, repetitive. But even then, um, I think for, a, for quite some time, AI would, we'd only be building tools that help, uh, people do these processes and we are like a long time away. And even in, in that process, it's going to create more jobs that it's going to take. Like, for example, when, when we had, uh, computers, people feared that it's going to take jobs, but look, uh, what we're doing right now, it created more jobs than it took. It created a lot more jobs than it took. Now, AI is also going to restructure jobs. It's going to allow people to open up. It's going to allow people to uh, be more creative because they don't have the burden to perform like a machine. All the mechanical things we can automate with artificial intelligence. There's going to be, uh, with universal basic income, there's going to be a rise in uh, certain sectors and there's going to be a fall in employment in certain sectors. This is how the graph's going to look. But all in all, uh, it's going to create more jobs than it's going to take. AI has its applications in different sectors when it comes to healthcare, transportation, uh, how it applies to everyday life civilization, uh, governance, and also in the automation of different business workflows. If we talk of healthcare, <clears throat> so in 2019, I was in Dubai at uh, AI Everything, and I saw there were a lot of startups which are already trying out some of them, but they're, they're only still scratching the surface. There are a lot of things which we can do. Like, for example, there are already tools out there which help doctors um, and ease their workload a little bit. So there are models which help uh, filter MRI scan data because there are, let's say it's someone's a pulmonologist, which is they're going to only look at uh, the area around the lungs. And there's a lot of data in an MRI scan or like any other things that they don't need to look at. Or there are many times a lot of, there's, there's noise. And there are AI models already, which are helping doctors clear out all of that. In radiology, there are, tools helping doctors 
um, in their everyday uh, data collection and then cleaning that data so that they can their process turns out to be faster and they can you know see more patients and uh, their tasks become easier and also more accurate because a, these AI models they've looked at uh, millions and billions of data points and then now uh, in many cases they're more accurate than like a, one doctor in let's say who's not that specialized uh, or in an, in an area who's not uh, who's not had that much experience also when it comes to the diagnosis of diseases all the diseases which can be um, seen by the eye uh, we can use cameras to detect, like for example acne and the different types of acne or uh, there are already apps out there which are trying these uh, the, these models out and more are going to come uh, we built a doc we built a model with uh, dr maya and we we had worked on diabetic retinopathy so our model could tell you with 85 percent accuracy whether you have diabetes or not by looking at your retina scan and uh, also more things like for example there are uh, there are no healthcare providers or services that are looking at uh, your disease classifications of the past 10 years or 20 years or your entire lifetime now let's say you had a disease when you were uh, 12 years old and now you're 16 and you're uh, you're developing another condition that condition could be linked with the previous condition and we don't have a uh, we, we don't keep a record of that now healthcare digitization is coming in and it's going to um, lead to hyper personalized healthcare and it's going to be able to uh, predict patterns it's going to be able to recommend doctors um, seeing what doctors have best treated those conditions with uh, of patients with similar conditions and it's also going to uh, help us uh, track diseases and the flow of diseases how many uh, we'd worked with dr bilal and we were looking at data of all the different uh, pathology lab results so you can see where a particular uh, disease is spreading like uh, malaria or something people are doing this for covid and this can help track uh, the spread of the virus and it can predict um, where and how many cases are going to be when so that we can take precautionary methods or for viral uh, mosquito spread diseases, we can see where a particular disease is and then we can target that area specifically and we can predict trends. Then there's mobility. Mm, AI is going to help us, uh, if we talk of logistics, we already know of self-driving cars. If we talk of logistics, um, you know, the carrying out a different process when it comes to uh, getting your package from a factory somewhere in the world to another place a lot of that can be automated and and when it comes to uh, drones and sending uh, products out or um, when it comes to automatic labeling and sending of packages uh, imagine robots that are picking up things from a factory and placing them in a vehicle that can be automated that that could be robotic process automation there are companies which are already working on that there's boston dynamics in boston uh, they have the uh, best robots and the best models in the world right now to take care of that and uh, there's going to be self i think first of all they're going to be assisted uh, cars entire autonomy uh, there are companies which are already uh, putting cars with uh, automatic uh, collision detection and those are going to come out they're going to help uh, us get there uh, get wherever we want to get to faster safer and uh, in a more eased fashion everything can be linked uh, when it comes to parking or the management of traffic, like there are already AI models. Uh, the, the professor that I worked with at MIT, uh, Dr. Elyasa Peterson, she was uh, working on such a model. So I saw over there and they're going to be out in the world very soon. AI has its applications in retail, uh, tracing customer feedback and uh, looking at, uh, you know, and then analyzing customer feedback we worked on a model which i'll show later on uh, being in touch with customers handling the interaction with customers through chatbots and amongst other processes 
AI, uh, AI, there's robotic process automation for all the secondary manufacturing process for all the tertiary manufacturing and for the tertiary services. There are uh, interaction tools, there are AI, there are AI tools that help uh, people interact with each other, like chatbots, tools that orchestrate uh, different workflows, different uh, orchestration of people within an organization. This is one thing that we built more than two years ago. Imagine any letter, uh, a letter can be simplified into two or three basic tasks. Like for example, someone uh, in a government office, they are sent a written letter. Now they read an entire letter. There's like the standard language. Now there are only two or three tasks that they can do, or let's say four or five. These many tasks they can do after reading a letter. So let's say the letter is kept on their desk and it automatically scans and then it comes on, it pops on their screen, it highlights the keywords and the uh, three tasks they can use. They can click the blue button, yellow button, red button, green button, whatever. So this is how AI can help in uh, the streamlining of processes and how it can make all of them faster. Uh, this is one of our projects and it does complete human feedback analysis. It looks at your facial expressions, your speech, your body language. If you said uh, the event was nice, the speakers were good and the food was okay. So it would uh, take all of that and categorize all of that and it would give that a feedback score. And we also have the world's highest performing facial micro expression recognition model that we developed um, at uh, Tensax Innovation Lab in Jaipur and it's still the world's highest performing facial micro expression recognition model. It gets the highest uh, accuracy for facial micro expressions. AI applies uh, in many ways to smart cities and uh, a lot of pro urban processes that we see around. Here are some more applications. Many we talked about already. There's all, it also applies to, uh, in economics, it could predict, uh, it can keep the different policy rates fluid and depending on how much transactions we are having, it can dynamically affect them because it can, uh, these AI models can analyze trillions of data points and can uh, optimize for the best outcomes. Let's quickly get into uh, a bit into machine learning and explain a few terminologies that we use around machine learning. So <clears throat> this is how the industry approaches. L like a mathematician solving a problem, we first identify the problem and then we define the ideology. What we mean by that is we must know all the variables that affect the outcome of our result. Like a mathematician, uh, before solving a math problem, we, we must know all the variables of the problem. We have the same approach. And then we collaborate with field expertise. Let's say we are uh, making a model in the healthcare industry. So we'll collaborate with doctors, we'll collaborate with pathology labs, hospitals, so that we get the data and we get the expertise in classifying those features. The features are the uh, data points which, are, which our model needs to learn to be able to predict things. And then we collect data, or either we generate data, then we uh, try out different models, we build different models, and then once we get we once we get to a prototype iteration, which is uh, which we're satisfied with, we build a user interface. We either we package it in an app or uh, we put it on the cloud, and then we build a web interface, and then we test it, and then we do uh, some marketing and sales, and we have a product out. And now we're going to talk of how these ML models go from design to development to deployment. You have to, uh, when we're working with these AI models, we have to be careful with um, what uh, data sort of details we're working with. We must know all the features and conditions that affect our problem. And uh, we must be good at working with the data, cleaning it, seeing different trends and patterns so that we can model them. And then our AI model can learn all of that and do well in a pra applied practical example. First of all, we have to collect the data. And um, this is how we, these are the types of data you can collect. Either you can uh, get the data yourself, which either you can do, uh, either you can click pictures, record audio samples, uh, or directly of the samples that you're working with, or you can get it from online data repositories or um, different places, different institutions that host uh, different data points and different data sets. 
Okay, we're a little bit short of time. Let me speed up. Okay. Here's where you can get data from. Kaggle is a place which hosts data science competitions. You can get data from over there. There's this extension called FATCOM Batch Image Downloader. You can go to Google Images, search for, let's say, if you want to build an image classifier that classifies cats, you can search for a cat and then you can download, bash download all of those images. There are, uh, in India, there's a government data portal, which is data.gov.in. You can uh, you can request access to private data sets mentioned in different research papers. You can contact the authors and you can also uh, do web scrapping and crawl different articles, web pages, different images. You can crawl social media and then you get data like that. The next part comes, uh, how, what do we do with the data? We have to be careful that our model doesn't have many biases which means that all the different uh, classes of the model, all the di different uh, categories are well represented. Then we visualize the data. Now we, we want to see trends within those data points. And these are some tools that we can use to do that. The Tableau is a software which is used to, uh, it's like a graph, it has a graphical user interface and it's easy to use. There's Mac.lib and Plotly, which are tools, uh, which are libraries uh, within the Python language that are also used. Here are some plots, some graphs, which these libraries have generated. You have different types of plots to represent your different data points so that you understand how your data is, and then you can start to model it. We do a lot of operations on the data to get it uh, optimized for the training and the development of a model. Uh, we have to get the data on the same scale. Like for example, if certain voice samples are loud and certain voice samples are soft, we get them on a similar scale so that our model can better look at the features of the, uh, within the data. Like if one image is lighter and darker and a few images are lighter and darker, that way we get them on a similar scale. So the features are equalized and we can, our model can look at them. We also generate more data from the data that we have. We can either rotate, skew, uh, images or uh, if when it comes to speed samples, uh, we can change the pitch, we can change the speed, and then we have more voice samples and look how many images can be created from a small number of images. We also do feature extraction. Like for example, over here, if you're classifying a horse, we take the horse out and we keep the, we remove the relevant parts so that then we can look at the horse and we can classify okay, which breed of horse it is. So we don't need uh, features which are not relevant to the problem that we're solving. If we were building a horse breed classifier, we don't need to look at all the other data points which are there. We can also generate more uh, training data. There are these algorithms called generative adversarial networks, which can learn uh, uh, learn from our data set and then, similar, then, then generate similar data. So it would generate like horses of uh, slight variations, like different color variations or different uh, different horse patterns from that data set. Now let's explore some more ML concepts. We'll first start with uh, image recognition. Um, you might have seen models like that. It's called, uh, these are called deep neural networks. They are used a lot these days. All of these dots that you see over there, they are called perceptrons. And uh, each and every single dot takes the uh, output from the previous layer, sum, sums it up and sends it to the next layer. And images, if you see, um, images are um, two Im images are arrays. If, if those are colored images, there would be uh, arrays of three channels, red, green, and blue. And if we were to train an image classifier, uh, we train it such that when the image passes through, all of the nodes that we saw, all of the nodes, we adjust the values of these nodes so that when the image passes through the model and it goes, it multiplies and it adds up. After all these multiplications, if we have the image that we're looking for, let's say we are making an image classifier that classifies zero. When we pass it through the model, if, if, okay, um, if an image which contains a zero passes through this filter, 
zero is illuminated pixels over here so blue are positive values and red are negative values so if zero passes over here it would produce a higher value which means higher confidence score so when it passes through the model we have to train it such that when it passes through the model it it gets a higher score so that we can classify whether the image has zero or not whereas if one would pass through it if one would pass through it it would it would not have a high score because one would have pixels uh, over here and when it gets multiplied it would result in a lower score compared to zero so this training is the adjusting of all of uh, all of those parameters such that when we pass the image through the model uh, we get the results that we are looking for and then this training graph looks something like this if we change our model this this whole uh, 2d surf this whole 3d surface would look different so these are all the adjustments possible uh within our model so we have to adjust the values of these nodes so that when it multiplies through the model we get the desired results this is a model used by google we talked of the building blocks of such models and uh, the models that are actually used uh, for different applications they can get big so inception v3 has a lot of layers and a lot of uh, these nodes if we talk about machine learning there's there are different uh, kinds we're going to go over them <clears throat> here are some terms that we've discussed already we have uh, talked of features features are the traits that describe uh, the different data sets the data points which are relevant um, for us to classify our uh, example or for us to work with like for example horse uh, or let's say faces would, would we would need to look at the eyes the nose the, the all the defining parts of a face feature extraction is getting the relevant features out samples uh, are uh, they are basically they are the number of data points that we have we're not going to go into the the math part behind it we uh, split our training data into two parts so that we can use uh, we generally do a 80 20 split so we use 80% for training and then 20% to see um, how far we are from the point that we have to get to so we train and test this is how the workflow looks here are the different categories of machine learning we have supervised learning so far we have talked of supervised learning where we have labeled data sets let's say okay this is a horse of um, let's say arabian breed or this is a horse of azerbaijan breed or a horse of an indian breed or different patterns then we have a labeled data set and that's called supervised learning and supervised learning is when we don't have a, a labeled data set we can have uh, a hybrid of both of these that would be semi supervised learning and this is how that's going to look we can have clustering of the uh, unsupervised part and then we have the supervised part working in conjunction with it we have reinforcement learning this is what the different um, video games use we have a actor reward policy like for example police in gta the character is trained uh, the police characters are trained such that when it they bust the criminal let's say the criminal gets two stars uh, they have to shoot and when they, are, they get three, three stars they bring a helicopter so they're trained this way and uh, okay so shooting the criminal or busting the criminal uh, gives the highest reward whereas uh, let's say harming a, a civilian uh, results in a punishment so there's this actor this agent deployed in an environment where it's given um, different rewards and punishments and then the model derives a policy so that way the police the character of the police has derived a policy and then the that is saved and that is run in the game and it also has its applications in uh, different factories and different industries when it comes to power optimization and when to switch on different machines for uh, load sharing and how to be most be the most efficient let's talk of a few machine learning uh, techniques we have uh, machine learning algorithms can do these tasks for us it they can classify like for example classification is let's say classifying of different horse breeds or uh, classifying of uh, a speech command we can also cluster like for example clustering boxes in a factory and labeling them uh, or or uh, sorting them in a particular way uh, clustering the also the types of boxes that we don't know of 
we have regression which is also called prediction prediction of different values and all of these can work in together and this these can be the building blocks for our machine learning models like for example a uh, uh, in robotic process automation of robot working in a factory would first classify uh, the different section the section it has to go there and then it would look at the different boxes let's say in amazon so it doesn't know what type of boxes so it would it would cluster them into different groups and then um, you know when it's let's say traveling from one place to another place it would predict the path of people so that it doesn't collide with them and so on there are so many applications over here and then we have language models these work with uh, human language and they include uh, chatbots different generative models in natural language processing you have natural language understanding that is the breaking down of these language tasks and understanding them understanding commands and then you have language generation language generation is something that's coming up we got the beta testing for uh, the beta testing access for gpt3 which is a model which costs six and a half million dollars and it's by uh, open ai which is head by elon musk so we've we've been we got the beta testing uh, access in one of the initial batches and we've been testing it out and uh, it can help you write emails and it for students it can help you do your homework and it has a lot of applications when it comes to customer interactions and uh, working with people let's say uh, having an assistant for online meetings or meetings that can help uh, like can understand all of that and then generate like let's say uh, summaries or schedule meetings automatically and take care of a lot of processes and then we have chatbots and these chatbots are trained with different data so have different they have different personalities let's talk of the different frameworks that we use uh, to run our models uh, okay there's also big data big data uh, is the idea that we're collecting so much data let's say google is collecting the data from so many users it can't store them on one computer nor can it store them on the device so we store this data on distributed systems on the cloud and then we use different tools to orchestrate that and then we generate uh, insights out of these data different patterns so that we can make products and we can uh, derive value from this and that's called big data when the data is so big that it can't fit on one system so you distribute it over large clusters and then you use these different softwares and different tactics to uh, derive some insight or some value from the data now let's talk of the technologies behind machine learning like what powers all the technologies that we've been talking about let's talk about the different frameworks and how they are served or how they're they're run or built you have all these different frameworks you might have heard for, heard of tensorflow and keras tensorflow and keras are now one uh, you have microsoft's uh, cntk it's used in research you have apple's create ml this one over here it allows you to run your own models um on ios and mac os you have the, these are research frameworks then you have pytorch pytorch is used in research and it's, its use has been increasingly growing and then you can either run them on a mobile device tensorflow allows you to run on a mobile device as well as a web browser pytorch allows you to run on native uh, mobile apps and you can also use this thing called onyx and then you can convert all of these models into onyx and then you can run onyx in the browser also many a times what happens is sometimes the models are so large that sometimes the models are so large that uh, they can't be stored on a, a particular uh, mobile phone if let's say the model is 7 gigabytes you can't store it on a mobile device no one would download that for like one app so you deploy your models on the cloud and we'll talk of how this cloud um, hosting is different and how it applies to machine learning models uh, we'll talk of how it's different when you host your models on the cloud um, you use containers and how that's different from traditional hosting is that in traditional hosting we had uh, different segmented virtual machines and on the, there would be one os in a server and then 
all of in in that server there would be different virtual machines allocated to different people in that virtual machine there's going to be another operating system so an operating system on, running on another operating system and every virtual machine has its own operating system and then your libraries the different things you need to run your code and then your app running on top of it so this was inefficient and this was also static and when you wanted to like if you wanted more ram and if, or if you if your users are in some other place you want to switch the location of the server you couldn't do that so with cloud hosting, we use containerization and we use Docker for that. And then we use Kubernetes to the, on, on the cloud, it's scalable. And what that means is, uh, first of all, there's one host operating system and then the libraries and dependencies are shared and then Docker runs on all your apps on these containers. So it's, it's a lot more efficient. And what that allows us to do is, um, on the cloud, we can if uh, our model is not being used by a lot of users, it can scale down. And if we have users, it can scale up. So Kubernetes helps us to manage that. And then we can also dynamically change the location of where our model is hosted. Let's say more users are using our model in Dubai. We can switch it over there. If more users are uh, using a model in, Sil in Silicon Valley or in Jaipur or Delhi, somewhere else, we can change the location uh, on the fly. So, which is why cloud hosting is uh, useful when it comes to machine learning, because the models can be large, let's say a seven gigabyte model, or even if a model is 450 megabytes, no one would download 450 megabytes. So this is one of our projects deployed on Google cloud. Uh, the major services are uh, Google cloud platform, Amazon's AWS and Azure. We found Google cloud platform uh, because we've used it. And this is one of our products uh, hosted over there. You have all of these features provided to you and we use the compute engine to store our app over there. So this is an alternative to running your uh, models on the device and you use the cloud for deploying them. So as we've seen, AI has its applications in all of these sectors, uh, whether it comes to healthcare or administrative workflow assistance or uh, giving people a better, um, better work experience by taking care of the repetitive tasks, all of these different sectors in a few years that it's already happening, but in a few years, we're going to be surrounded by AI tools in the workflow in, in our, in our, in our workspace, in our different workflows. And so we should be ahead of this change and we should be the ones benefiting from this change. Revenues of different, um, companies incorporating AI, uh, software, it's been growing and it's projected that it's only going to grow. Let's quickly talk of like a few a enterprise AI case studies. This is C3 AI. This is, uh, a large, uh, American enterprise AI company. So they, hmm. their website doesn't seem to be working at the moment. So they work with in different sectors and they build AI models for different companies. Here's another example. This is G42 AI. They are in the UAE and the, uh, and Dubai, and these are the industries that they serve. The Middle East, by the way, is doing a lot of innovation. They are open to these ideas. And I think that trend is going to follow in other places. This is Al Khali GI. We've worked with Al Khali GI very closely and they're uh, a leading AI company in the Middle East. And they've been working um, on a lot of healthcare uh, AI solutions. They've worked with uh, Mashrik Bank and the document automation part and uh, different, different applications of AI in the Middle East. And uh, these areas are open to AI innovation like is Silicon Valley. And then uh, the rest of the places in the world, they're going to follow up soon. So this company is working in uh, smart governance, uh, healthcare, they're working in fintech, uh, they're working in oil and gas and others. So they're working in like energy uh, and then workflow automation, the thing that they did with uh, the Mashrik Bank, the leading bank over there. We've been closely linked with them. This is our innovation lab. 
and uh, we run different programs. We have built a lot of different AI uh, models over the years. We've, we've built and deployed AI models. We've done a lot of AI research. We have many uh, of our research products of our own uh, and research projects. Uh, we've seen uh, the feedback analyzer, the uh, document intelligence part, and others we work with factories even. We've worked in the healthcare industry and we worked in workflow automation, uh, human language, language models, um, human feedback and a lot of other things. And this is it. We have, we are out of time and uh, it was, it was good interacting with you. Now let's have a few questions and let's make it interactive and let's talk for some time and then let's wrap it up for any questions or queries. Uh, you can talk to us anytime, uh, drop me an email, drop us an email or uh, schedule an appointment to visit 10 Sachs Innovation Lab anytime. Uh, we'd be happy to welcome you. Let's have uh, a few questions. Oh, okay. Can you please discuss a bit more about AI and office workflows? So AI, uh, okay, when it comes to documents and working with different things, it can summarize one example that we talked about. It it's already helping people in human resources, uh, filtering applicants, and then um, finding the best fit for uh, the organization. And then it has different specific applications as well. Let's say, um, if someone is, um, okay, let's say, uh, agriculture. Okay. Someone is into an agriculture business. So they, are they're running a place where they're classifying different types of fruits, let's say small or big, or, okay. They're, they're looking at the coloration of fruits to see whether they are ripe or not. And they have, they have to process like one lakh fruits every day. So we can have AI tools, which can take care of that. So you can have a conveyor belt and then a camera and then a, and a robotic arm that uh, then sets them to different spaces. There are specialized models like that. And then there are models which are um, generic, like mm, how about an AI assistant that uh, helps people in, mm, like there are already these tools that are going to come out, which are going to uh, be there, just assistants scheduling meetings automatically, uh, listening to different online interactions, helping with remote work, all of these tools are going to be there. Hope that answers your question. If you talk of a more specific example, we can talk about how that applies to that industry. How do you see artificial intelligence being utilized uh, in ventures that don't have a tech base? Okay. Okay. Technology is a thing that facilitates other things. Technology, um, let's say in the healthcare industry, a health, uh, a hospital is not about the technology. A hospital is about the people. A hospital is about um, curing people. A hospital is about the health of people. And then we use artificial intelligence as a thing that helps facilitates different things over there. That helps um, and assists and augments and automates. That helps drive the, the growth and helps drive the um you know the the improvement in workflows of tasks at other places so it's it's that okay uh, any more questions that we have Okay, it was uh, good talking to you all of you and I hope to see you in the next one. For any questions or queries, you can email us or schedule an appointment to visit 10 Sachs Innovation Lab anytime 
and i hope to see you soon all right thank you bye bye